I really believe that the, that trust is the uber culture. It's the overlying, I mean, it, it, it supersedes anything. Welcome to 33 Tangents, a roundtable discussion covering a wide variety of topics from digital analytics to working remotely to current happenings in business and technology. Your hosts, Jason Thompson, John Moran, Jen Coons, and myself, Jim Driscoll, all live in different areas of the world, but work together in the same company. Our regular day-to-day conversations often go off in various directions, and the goal of this podcast is to share our ideas and find new ways to engage with others. Anyway, I ran out and I left my computer, my my phone, and my key card, and uh, I wanted to lock my office so nobody would walk in during the recording, and uh, yeah, I locked myself up. So, I apologize. I apologize. Amazing. No yeah, worries. Nah, nah. It's all good. Pretty, pretty impressive guest. Yeah, well, you know, that's how we roll, you know. We, uh, we don't have it overly polished or produced, so locking yourself out right before the beginning is kind of par for the course here, as they say. Good, good, because I'm pretty flustered, so I'll have to calm down, but I'm ready to go when you're ready to go. No worries. So I actually already hit record, because oh, we usually just start off by shooting the shit a bit, yeah. um, and then we dig into the topic um, at hand, so I figured you know that that would actually probably be a good way to uh, <laughs> to start a, things a off. To, yeah. Good intro. Yeah, it's a good way to a good way to start it. Yeah. So we have we have Dan Roden with us today um, as a as a guest. So f- full disclosure, Dan and I, man, two thousand four, two thousand five, two thousand four, yep. back in the the Omniture days, Dan and I crossed paths and worked on several accounts together, including. Uh, Major League Baseball, which was awesome. Have lots of fun stories to share there. Dan's currently at, at Domo. He's a big deal. Product evangelist. Uh, I see him all over the country. He's a he's a great public speaker um, and evangelist for the brand. What has it been like eight eight nine years at at Domo? Yep. Yeah. Um, and so Dan Dan's kind of been around the game for a long time. I'm excited to to talk to him. And he's got you know Dan Dan is one of those guys that has lots of of great ideas, uh, not only around building businesses and products, but just culturally things that make businesses run well. So I'm super excited to have him him on. Um, as I mentioned, you know we we work together at at Omniture on on Major League Baseball. I want to say MTV as well. Saks Fifth Avenue um, are all kind of clients that we worked on together. Uh, you end up going to work for Major League Baseball at some point in time, yep. uh, running kind of their their digital measurement strategy across all of the hundreds of properties that they have. And I think you and um, and uh, what was it GSI at the time? Yeah, mm-hmm. you may have have crossed paths with with Jim. I remember some of those GSI discussions. Um, but yeah, Dan's been around. Then you kind of did your your own thing for a while, working with Raytheon, NBC Universal, others. Finally got back into the the fold. Josh kind of made a strong pitch at you to join Domo back, tiny, 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 and you've been there ever since. So man, we're super excited to to have you on um, and. And, and talk about a few really interesting topics we have keyed up here. Oh, man, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to opening up and talking about, you know, over the course of, geez, 15 plus years of working for various different types of businesses and um, seeing, you know, what makes some really successful, where people can improve. And it's funny, I, I swear, Jason, back in the, our old Omniture days, I swear we probably had more discussions around culture and what makes a good work team than we ever did about analytics or anything like that. And and I think that's an important thing that, you know, that, you know, it is on top of your mind, especially when we're young in our career. I don't know about you, but Omniture was kind of, I wouldn't call it my first real job, but it was my first real corporate job, I think, um, where I was interfacing with other organizations of, of any size. And, um, you know, going from customer to customer and working with different teams, you really are exposed to what work life really is. And, and you, you know, you work with people who love where they work. You work with people who don't like where they work and through interviews and questions and going out to dinner. And you, you really kind of figure out what makes people tick. And you start to 
in my, in, well, at least for me, what I started to do, I started to divide um, people into classifications of groups of how they like to work, where they like to work, and, and uh, their personality types and what made them successful in certain places and unsuccessful in certain places, even though they remained constant through their careers. Um, so, you know, this is, this is all, I guess, coming to a head after 15 years of, of knowing each other and, and uh, working together. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, for sure. And, it, you know, I, I don't know that we appreciated it at the time of how awesome an opportunity it was that, that we had to get exposed to all of these brands. I, I rattled off just a, a few of them, but the opportunity to get inside these companies. And as you pointed out, we, we got to see a lot more than just data. Um, and yep. a lot of our conversations are around like what what makes a company successful from a from a people standpoint, from a culture standpoint. And you're right. I mean, so as my second real job, quote unquote, out of out of college, my first job, I was kind of stuck in the basement in IT. And all of a sudden, I'm a 24 year old kid. And they're like, okay, go to New York and meet with Viacom and tell them how to measure their websites. I'm like, <laughs> right. <"What?" laughs> yeah. No, I know. Okay. I know. Yep, exactly. <laughs> but hey, I mean, so. it was a great it was a great place to cut your teeth. And, and honestly, I couldn't think of a better breeding ground than to kind of get shoved into it, baptism by fire, uh, you know, as one might say, to, to do it. Otherwise, we would, I think we all have a little bit of anxiety and reclusiveness in our, in our uh, skills, and I think we would probably hang in the background if we weren't pushed out in front. So I think it was a great opportunity for us early in our careers. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Um, so, Jim, do you remember crossing paths with, with Dan while you were at GSI, or you just happened to kind of be there at, when he was at... at uh, BAM Media, but ML BAM? Yeah, M MLB Baseball Advanced Media. Yeah. 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 Um, so no, I, I remember his name coming up because I made a pivot my career um, in 09 and started with GSI in 09. That's when I started to get involved in web analytics. Prior to that, I had worked in financial reporting and SEC reporting software and, and implementing that. So I want to say early on, uh, Major League Baseball was like one of the first projects I was put on as as I was cutting my teeth in, in the analytics space. So I remember at one point, Jason, maybe about a year ago, you and I were, were tossing some ideas around and Dan's name came up. I'm like, wait, that's familiar. Where do I know that name from? And yeah, it took me back to my, my early days at GSI. You know, we were awesome. talking about culture. It was quite an interesting culture, culture there, which, you know, you both in you know your interactions through major league baseball probably got the a bit of taste of oh yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely so do you want to you want to key up speaking of kind of all of those those kind of backstories you want to key up our our topic for today yep uh, so i've got a, a you know a, a um description to kind of kick us off based on just some of the the brief conversations we had going back and forth and then you know i know we were also tossing around some ideas via email to about what we want to talk about but like the overall topic I was thinking of, or like Dan, you proposed, you know, building a culture of trust, and mm -hmm. so you know, the, the business world is often thought of as, as cold and calculating. You know, from an employee perspective, the only purpose you know employees are often seen to serve is to make widgets and ch check items off off a list. And when when push comes to shove, employees are often cut loose when finances are tight. Um, employees are scared to reach out and ask for for help for fear of being seen as weak or thought of as as less and that leading to, to someone taking their job or taking you know their their position within the company um, but you know in recent years we've seen that there are many out there that are trying to, to change that and um, you know more and more people are talking about building a culture of trust within their business a, um, if, if they're a business owner or at least say in their organization as, as, as a leader um, the key things with a trust culture is the ability to be honest and vulnerable. Jason, you and I talk about that frequently, you know, in order to make yourself, your team, your org better. So I thought, let, let, let's just start off with a, with, with a very general statement of, you know, let's start, um, talk about what a culture of trust means to each of us. And Dan, I know you threw some, some initial topics out there. So who wants to, to kind of kick it off? Uh, you know, I, I guess I can, you know, I, um, you know, culture in a company, I've, I've been in several different companies and I've, I've been in, in different cultures um, in each one. In fact, I can't, you know, even the early Omniture culture that was founded by Josh James, the Domo culture is similar but still different. Um, 
and you know baseball was a very different culture um, and one thing that I found was that so often people use their culture as a way to recruit right that's a big HR piece is mm-hmm. oh come and look at you know look at all the fun things we do and you know blah 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 um, I've I've found that my most successful times in my career have been when I have been surrounded by people that I trust to do their jobs very well, people that I trust that will help me um, advance in my career, and and people that I know carry a certain, I I don't want to overstate it, but a self-pride about their work and makes me have a certain comfort level that when we work on projects together that there is a there is a trust between our groups to not only do a good job um, for the company but also our name brand is on that and with a singular goal to to do our best work and all the other pieces the ping pong tables the free food everything else the work hard play hard whatever whatever HR wants to spin it all of those things really are secondary even tertiary to what really matters i think um in a in a good culture and so that's that's why i mean jason and i have talked about this for years um the difference between being able to walk into your boss's office and know that your boss has your best interest in mind and it may not include staying at that company it may include hey uh you know we see you as a talent that is going to be stifled here and we want to groom you for better things outside of this company. And also, you know, coworkers who want the best for you, who aren't walking into meetings and taking your ideas and spouting them as your own, as their own. And, and those are the type of, that's the type of culture that, you know, when we talk about a trust culture, it goes well beyond, uh, you know, can you look to your right and left and trust the people you're working with in, in, the, in the room? It's, can you really trust that, that organization really wants the best for you uh, as an individual and, and, and promoting your, your career path going forward. So those were just kind of some of the thoughts that I had initially, um, but I'm not, I'm not 100% versed on every element of what a trust culture looks like, but I, but I think those are really foundational elements to it. Jim, this is a, an interesting intersection because we were just talking yesterday um, we were having a conversation about building some some frameworks around how we do content management at, mm-hmm. at 33 Sticks. And you, you said something to me like, yeah, but I don't want to come off like an ass, like I'm micromanaging the team. And <laughs> I don't want to. And I'm like, you know what? The difference is, is that hopefully we've developed a culture where everyone um, has a, a belief that we're trying to make each other and the company successful. And it doesn't come off as, well, why is Jim doing this? Because he's trying to look good to Jason so he can get promoted. And like, it, as long as you have that trust, it makes that conversation completely different. And, you know, as I think about, as, as Dan mentioned and brought up the topic, trust culture and thinking about what does that mean to me? I had that really, really high on my list that you have a belief that personal success comes from making other people successful. Um, mm. to, to me, that's such a critical part of, of trust. Otherwise, I'm always going to be um, a little concerned about what people's motivations are, you know, and, and spending my time thinking, well, why is person A doing that? You know, are they trying to undercut me? Are they trying to like leapfrog me on the corporate ladder? You know, I, I don't want to spend my brain cycles thinking about that. I want to be surrounded by people that I'm like, these people want me to be successful because they know that by making me successful, they'll be successful. Yeah, absolutely. And that's and that's really what it comes down to is um, and I think in order to have that type of culture, you know, you have to have a couple of things in place. I think number one is there has to be kind of a mission, right? Like an, a mission that everybody is on board with. Um, and I, I'm not talking about that fluffy corporate mission statement that people put on a plaque and stick in their lobby. I'm talking about everyone's in alignment for what they're going to do and why they're doing it. Um, whether, you know, I, and Jason, I think you and I can speak to this back in the early Omniture days, we were maniacally focused on customer. Um, when you and I worked together, it wasn't about what can we do to look good. It was all about making our customer happy about our service and our product. And I think that really rallied, you know, Jason and I were on the, Jason was more on the technical side. 
of customer engagement. I was more on the account management relationship side. And, you know, there was nothing better than taking Jason into a room with me at baseball, um, knowing that his interest is to make sure that baseball was successful. He, I mean, he didn't care about me. Um, it wasn't about me. It wasn't about, oh, what can I do to, to save, to help Dan in this account? It was, what can we do to make baseball successful because that's what's best for the company. He trusted me to handle the relationship side. I, ha I trusted him on his business acumen and his technical side. And we had the same goal, to go in there and win and satisfy a customer. And there was nothing more gratifying in, in, in my tenure um, at Omniter was than trusting the people that I worked with to be all on the same page of why we were doing what we were doing. And yeah. uh, that was huge. That was huge for me. It, it, it was. And, you know, I think back on that and I, I wonder how that happened. Um, you know, I think part of it was the people that were hired early on. It definitely was yep. uh, a huge component of it. I, I think yep. part of it was we, we kind of lacked structure. I don't, you know, in the very early days, we <laughs> didn't have much of a sense of how to run a services organization. Uh, and I think even someone, I, I want to say we were in a, a company meeting in the, the break room with the pool table and someone asked Josh about like, well, like, how do we know how much time to spend with a client? And because we didn't sell our like, it was just, yeah. and he's like, he's like, I don't care. Just make sure they're happy. Like make sure yeah. they're successful and make sure that you show the value in the product. And so I think part of it was just an outcome of, we didn't have any other structure of how to do services other than our structure was make sure the client is successful. So. Well, and, and to that point, Jason, I think that's, that's interesting that we talk about that. Cause you know, when you and I started there, we were really early in our careers and, and Josh was fairly early in his career, you know, they haven't been, they hadn't gone public yet and, you know, really hadn't accomplished a lot at that point in his career. But it was, it was, I think, important for us to hear that from leadership, that that was our responsibility. He didn't mire it down in a bunch of processes and procedures and, you know, check boxes. It was ultimately, this is your mission to make that customer happy. Because in a SaaS business, we know renewal is the number one, you know, it's number one. So um, I think that was important to hear that from leadership and then allowing good people to be able to take that, uh, you know, and consume that in the way that they want to consume it and, and execute the best they know how. And so, um, you know, Jim, one thing about trust cultures, and Jason and I have talked about this quite a bit, one thing that I think about with the trust culture is sometimes culture feels really daunting and we leave it up to the executive team or we leave it up to the HR team to, de to define what the culture is. But Jason and I, uh, back in the Amateur days, Jason, remember when, when we got sick and tired of the break room and we started going over to Harmon's and buying meat and grilling on the back of my yep. truck and and we yep. we got tired of sitting and we and we got tired of sitting in a hot um, parking lot. So then we went to Walmart and bought lawn chairs and sat in the shade and and I don't know if that's I don't know if that's culture, but it was what our small group of people did and it was fun um, and we enjoyed it, but. Um, you know, that didn't come from leadership. Nobody told us to go do that. Nobody told us, nobody sent out a memo from HR saying, hey, go do fun team things for, you know, for team building and, and get to know your people. I, I think it just kind of organically happens. And when we talk about, a, you know, cultures, I think there's a lot of people that are going to listen to this podcast that think, hey, I'm not in a position to influence culture. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one writing, you know, the culture manifestos for our company. I'm not the CEO of the company. So how do I influence culture. Well, I, I truly believe that culture in all of its forms comes from, it's a, it's more of a grassroots element, but the nice thing about a trust culture is you can actually implement it just yourself. You don't even have to, you don't even have to have a team. You can just be about you. And, you know, Jim, I, I sent, I think before we started this podcast, I asked, you know, what were, what are three characteristics of someone who's trustworthy that, that you've worked with in the past that, that um, that might be, you know, obviously there's going to be more than three, but what are what are three characteristics that stick out to you um, as somebody who you've worked with that is that is that you trust? And I think if we talk about that, I think I'm, I'm going to kind of weave this together, and I think I'm going to show that there's a lot we can do to generate a trust culture inside of an organization that has nothing to do with HR or an executive. Uh, mandate so to speak. Yeah. So, so so hold on Jim because I want yeah. you to jump into that um, but <laughs> yep. before you do I you know Dan brings up a really really important point and it's something we've mentioned on the podcast before is that we know a lot of our listeners you know a lot of them are in you know management positions a lot of them are individual contributors 
but you know a lot of them work for really really big companies where they feel like you know we this we love these conversations but we're not in a position to to really make any change and and the the tone that we've been setting is you are you know that that culture and change can start with an individual person regardless of your position and even if it's just starting with your team or your group of peers um, you can have a, a tremendous impact. I, I totally forgot about the, the lunchtime barbecues. <laughs> Those were amazing. Uh, yeah. But it did remind me of another story at, at Omniture where I got, uh, I got a little bit of a talking to about my dress um, at work. It was a little on the casual side. And so uh, I started showing up to work in a, in a button-down shirt and tie. And I remember that. I didn't say anything to anybody. I just started wearing it. And a few weeks later, there, there was a pretty good chunk of people showing up in a <laughs> button-down shirt and tie. And I got called into the office. I'm like, what the hell are you doing, Thompson? Are you trying to make a point here with these guys showing up like this? I'm like, I didn't say anything to them. Right? But it just goes to show that, you know, I wasn't in any management or leadership position. But it just goes to show that one person can have a massive impact on on the overall culture and attitude of a of a company so oh yeah no no doubt no doubt so, so jim, jim i'm anxious to hear it yeah well, what's your what's your three before i jump into that i do want to say it seems like the whole grilling in the office thing is definitely something in the analytic space uh because at one point when i was at gsi i was on the agency side of the business they moved analytics and product over to the agency and Friday afternoons, it just happened organically. Me and three of the other guys there started grilling steak on a George Foreman grill. And we got into a routine where every Friday it was one person's job to go out and buy the steaks for the whole group. And we, next thing you know, we had this set up with a mini fridge, a nice George Foreman grill, all the various spices and rubs and reusable plates. And, you know, the whole back of the office smelled like, like uh, steak every Friday afternoon. And we were at a point where we were just like, the, 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 the work never stopped. And they went to our boss and were like, come on, you got to stop this. Like, the, the office reeks. And she's like, <laughs> those guys are working like 60 hours a week right now. If, if it makes them happy to grill steaks on a Friday, I don't care. So, yeah. but I, I think it, 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 it's funny you guys mentioned you did that because we did the same thing. I think, I think we got a little bit of flack as well for the, we did. the grilling. And I, and I think Ooh, part yeah. of it was people just felt like they wanted to be part of that, that yeah. culture, too. It's, it was fun. Yeah, well, I, so believe, the way it was... I believe it was termed as unprofessional, if I remember, Thompson. Is that... <laughs> sounds, I think that that's kind of how... Right. That sounds about right, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, but we had so what they time. did in this one part of the office, they, had, they, they converted an office into a room, and they put three of the guys there, and then I was sitting outside of that. And when two of them started, after about three weeks of it, I was like, okay... I don't care, but just invite me to join you. And then it grew to, 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 to four of us. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was a fun thing. Um, and it did. It, it just helped kind of relieve some of the stress. And, you know, when people complained, our boss had, had our back. It was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to tell him to stop. Um, but as far as like the three characteristics, you know, I, I took a moment to think about it. And I know trustworthiness is kind of cir a circular answer. So I didn't put that down. <laughs> But, um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is just anything in, in life, is just someone who has, like, a genuine or authentic nature about them. You know, I, I, I do believe I've got a pretty good bullshit meter, and I can feel when someone's selling me or, 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 or whatnot. So it, it, it's, I, I, I really gravitate to the people that are genuine, that they, they, they present themselves, and they're not overly produced. So they're not curating, you know, the, 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 this perfect, polished look that you know they you know they are themselves um and then to that point too you know they're, they're also honest i know that seems like a really easy answer but again for me if if i start catching someone you know they, being being loose with the truth i mean that that, that really burns things for me and it, it takes a while to earn any kind of trust back and then the last thing is is you know, i wrote it down as like does what they say they're going to do so, I mean, we all have those times where it's like, oh, yeah, I'll get to this. And then it just falls off the list and it doesn't get done. But more times than not, you know, someone says, yeah, like, you know, when they say they're going to do something, they, they, they actually follow through. That's, you know, that, that's an important, uh, you, know, uh, you know, aspect for me. Awesome. And Jason, I pose the same questions to you. 
before this. What yeah, were your his, three? His, it's it's eerie that ours are a little closely aligned here. So my number one is when you make a promise, keep it. That that to me is the is the biggest component of, of building a trust culture. Number two, I think Jim was this was on your list as well. Is I labeled openness and transparency. Um, just you know, being vulnerable, being able to have open and co- open conversations. It's not about curating a certain look that you think that I should have. It's about being human, and and humans are fallible and make mistakes and don't know everything. And um, you know, people who are able to freely admit what they know and what they don't know are 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 confident in themselves to ask for help. That to me builds massive trust. And then number three, I, I already mentioned is. A belief that personal success comes from making other people successful. Yeah, well, you know, you 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 bring those three up, and you know, and we're we're having this conversation around trust around corporate discussions, right? Work work life, um, people we work with. Obviously, there's a lot of things that happen in our personal lives that that affect our our um, our own per, our own trustworthiness and and how we view other people as trustworthy. But you know, you you. Th- those three are, are very, very common. I've, I've actually done quite a bit of um, polling with people I've worked with in the past and people I work with now with these, these same type of questions, and they're all, they're all pretty similar. Um, one, one, a few others that come up on top of all those are things like, um, especially in, when you're talking about in the workforce, is, is their competency, right? Um, we, we tend to trust people who know what they're doing. Um, and Jason, to your point, it's so refreshing when when somebody will admit, "Hey, I'd, I'm not the best at this, but I'm happy to give it my best shot." Um, because you're not you you know you know where you stand with people, you know where you stand with your team. Um, you know when it comes to competency. I mean, there's nothing worse than walking in to a scenario where we, where you're supposed to be the experts, and you bring your team in and you see your team kind of falter a little bit because they maybe through self, I, I don't know how to, how to say it, but maybe they were afraid to say, hey, I, I'm, I'm not the best person for this. And they, they took the responsibility, we went in and you go and you meet with a customer or whatever it might be and, and you don't have the right team in the room and that's, that's tough, that's really tough. Um, so competency of, of their roles and then also, I, I don't know how to say this and I'm gonna give, I guess, maybe an analogy. I, I like people, sports wise, um, I like people who play for the team on the front of the jersey but are also but the name on the back of the jersey is important to them as far as um their their name means something to them and jason i think you've you've probably worked with a few people jim i'm sure you have as well where people they're, they're it's not an arrogance factor it's simply that it would kill them to let somebody else down it would kill them to not show up prepared with the best that they could do and then we've all worked with other people who are fairly nonchalant about their quality of work and their deliverable that will show up and you know what, if they just were kind of had an off day, well, it's an off day, they shut it down and that's it. Um, and they come unprepared to, to the meeting, they come unprepared with our customer. And so there's that certain element of, of self pride that I think matters to me when I trust somebody is that I know that they don't want to let my team down. They're not doing it for them. They, we, I know that they don't want to let the team down. And that, that's hugely important for me. I'll take, I'll take 20 people like that in a company over 20 people who are really good at their job, but would be totally fine, you know, not delivering just because, you know, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know. If yeah, no, no, it, 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 it makes, it makes absolute sense. And honestly, I hadn't thought down that path. You know, I was thinking around, all the characteristics of, do I just trust this person as a person? But you bring up a really valid point, whether it's we're on a, a team together that's that's playing a, a playing ba- basketball or baseball, or we're on a team together producing a software product, uh, there, there has to be an element in trust in actually having skills and expertise for what we're trying to do to, to win the game. Um, yeah. and, and that's something I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about, but I think it's a very valid, um, component to the overall culture of trust that that you develop within an organization yeah well i mean well to keep it on the sports side jason you're you're you really love soccer i'm not a soccer guy um but you know athletic enough uh if if 
we, if we were playing in a corporate uh, soccer tournament and you invite me to play as kind of your your last player on to fill out a roster, right? We just need a body, okay? Well, I happen to be going in and I get a, a, a penalty kick, a goal kick, but I'm not a soccer guy. There I am to win the, win the match there, right? Lined up against the goalie one-on-one. What is your trust factor in me of actually being able to execute this win? Pretty right. low, just because I don't <laughs> right. have the skill set. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick the ball, but it, it may sail 20 yards over the top of the post. Mm-hmm. But I but but you know, versus somebody who was a good player, maybe your best player happens to get that that free kick. I mean, your confidence level, your trust level, of that player is gonna go through the roof because you know they've put in the time and the hours and they have the skill set to execute. Um, I think that's a that's a huge factor. Um, and especially when we're talking about working with people um, is do we trust that they're competent to do it? And also, do they have the right nature to where they are willing that when they do fail, when they do know that they're coming up short, that they put in the extra time to improve their skill set? Um, you know, again, go back to sports. I think there's a lot of talented athletes in the world. Um, that are not playing at high levels because they they trusted their athleticism first, whereas there are people who are mediocre but will put in the time to constantly improve, um, to overcome maybe their limitations in their physical uh, abilities, that they're the ones playing at the highest levels of sport because of their willingness to put in the time to, to constantly improve. So those are some of the, some of the yeah. things I think of too. So so let me ask you this. I'm I'm interested if if you have some some real world examples. Again, you've had the opportunity to work with lots of companies, and, and maybe it's a sports team that you, I know you're a huge yeah. you had a huge baseball fan. Um, what companies teams have you seen that have really built a, a strong culture of trust and. Is it, is it an organizational wide thing that you've seen? Is it more, well, I've seen companies where certain teams or certain groups within the company operate really well. And where does that come from? Is it, does it come from the grassroots effort of, you know, just someone that gets it that wants to make it happen? Or is it really more top leadership that is making it happen? In, and again, in some of these real world organizations where you've seen this actually working. Yeah, okay. so. Um, I'm going to preface that I, I don't believe a trust culture can exist in a company culture that's toxic. And by that I mean um, I think that the overall top-down culture needs to be one that um, is positive. And, I, and like I said, there's a million different cultures out there. Some people believe culture comes from game rooms and free food. Some people believe culture comes from being able to go out and grill steaks on a Friday. Some people believe that culture is mandated by HR. Or, you know, I believe it is a grassroots effort. And I believe that I don't think I've, ever, I don't think I've worked in a company, and I, and I don't want this to be a disparaging thing because I've, I've taken a lot of value from everywhere I've worked, honestly. Um, I don't know that it's that from a trust culture perspective, I've ever been part of an organization where um, it's been truly a trust culture. I've worked on teams that have definitely been that way. Um, Smaller subsets of groups. I think, Jason, let's go back to you and I. I I mean, in your head, we unless you want to call them out personally on this on this podcast in your head, think about those early Omniture days. If you had to go in front of a customer to solve a big problem, there were probably a half a dozen people in your mind that you that you wanted in that room, and you weren't didn't mean you were best friends with them, didn't mean that you know you guys hung out after work, but there was like for me one of those guys that I'll that I'll pull out was Tim Lott. Um, I had a t- I had a huge amount of of uh, trust when Tim was on me or, or with me on a project. Um, I, I really trusted Tim. Um, I trusted you. I mean, I, actually, I don't want to name people because I'm afraid I'm going to leave somebody else that I did trust. But there, there were just, I think we've all been there where we, there were certain people that walked in the room and you took a deep breath like, oh, good, they're here. Good, good. I'm, 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 I'm more emboldened now with them at my side than if they weren't here. Um, but as, as, far as, as far as a real, you know, so that would honestly be to me a, a real world example of a micro trust culture that we had that we we didn't formally call it trust culture and we didn't write a book about it. We just you just kind of know. Um, 
I can also say that there are, there have been times when I have not had trust, and let me and let me tell you let me tell you why. Um, in fact, I'm going to give you a real a, a real example. Um, um, early in the in the domo, uh, the, the the domo days, uh, early in domo, we we actually have a lot of really good people here. And, and Jason, you talked about that. You talked about the importance of just the individuals themselves, and and that's where I think character really comes into play when you're building a trust culture. I think people who lack character are will never be trustworthy. That might be a blanket statement, but if I, I just because that's what we that's what we build our trust on is their character. Doesn't mean that they're perfect people, but we know how they're going to behave, and we know that they have certain attributes that lend itself to trustworthiness. Um, but there's also in the course of working, um, you know, on projects that there are certain elements that we had here early at Domo where there was a ton of really good people where we trusted each other because we all had one vision and focus, and it was crazy, and we were working our guts out. And we did a lot of we did a lot of good work, but there were a few again to be not named, but there were a few that that I've worked with that the reason we didn't trust them wasn't because of an uh, overarching they were a non trustworthy individual. What it came down to was um, I, I'm going to give you a project. So we we had a project that had a that had a deliverable, and it was an important deliverable for the company. Um, it was on the marketing side, and there were a small team of us. There were about six or seven of us. All of us were given certain tasks to accomplish this goal, and uh, we we would have meetings about it, and we would all commit to dates. I will have this done by this date. I will have this done by this date, etc. It's very common. Well, one of our team members was very non-committal in everything. Like it was almost as if he was scared to actually have an expectation of delivery. And it was a ho hum, ham and haw. Well, maybe, maybe Friday, and we just couldn't, we couldn't afford that. So when we would break meetings, we, we had some serious doubts of this person's ability to deliver on time. And so I took it upon myself to kind of manage that and get feedback and make sure that we were on top of things. And um, I found that. One one of the biggest problems that we had was that this person would not communicate with us. We'd break, we'd go for a week, we'd say, okay, we, we all have work to do, we go to our own corners and get our work done, but we expected check-ins to make sure that we were on time for this deliverable. Well, this person never checked in. Everybody else was, hey, I'm just letting you know, I'm, I'm making really good progress, here's some of the, the hurdles I'm running into, so I might extend my um, I might have to extend a little bit, but we always knew where everybody stood, except for this one person would go into this black hole, and we would never, we never knew where they, where they were at. And it was, hey, how are things coming? It was direct questions. What's the status with no reply? Well, we're sweating bullets because we got to go sit in front of the executive team on Friday and show them our completed work. And on Thursday, we still don't have any visibility into this person's um, uh, I guess completion of his project, what it, what it's looking like, and in the eleventh hour, literally the eleventh hour, we'd get an email from this person with their deliverable. The deliverable looks good. Probably could have used a little bit of tweaking, but we were so late in the game, we couldn't afford to tweak. So we included it in the project, and we went in, and everything was fine. But afterwards, I did a little uh, after action report with the team and just off the side and said, hey, how do you like working with this person? And they all said the exact same thing. They all said, I don't know if I can trust that person to deliver. And I said, based on what? And they said, based on the fact that we never hear from, that we never hear from that person. They are constantly in the black. There's no communication. And I thought, well, that's interesting because what he actually, you know, what was delivered was actually pretty good. At the end of the day, it came on time. But the problem was it came in the 11th hour. Everybody was sweating bullets of whether it was actually going to get done because all of our names were on this project. And at the end of it, it turned out fine. But we found that every single project that this person was a part of became our most stressful projects because we never knew if we could trust that person to actually deliver on time because of his lack of communication. So one thing that I, that I want to bring up is trust doesn't always have to be this like inherent... Um, like you're born with its skill or a character. There's a lot of things that we can do to improve 
our, our trustworthiness to our, our coworkers and people that we work with. And I think communication is one of those skills that we can all improve on. And so we finally pulled this person aside and just said, hey, you know, we get a little nervous that you don't communicate. He had no idea that that was a, a stressor for the rest of the team. And after that, did a much better job of communication, and it was, it was amazing how much better we felt about working with that, with that person. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's the, the world's greatest, but, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that add anxiety to people that we work with. Can we trust that, A, are they going to do a good job? Are they going to deliver on time? Can they communicate about it? And those are real simple, three simple measurements, but it, it really did affect the way that we wanted to work with that person, whether we trusted. Like, when he got assigned to one of our tasks, it was like, oh, geez. <laughs> We don't wait. You know what I mean? We don't know yeah. if we want to work because it, it adds stress to the rest of us. So, so this may be completely uh, off topic and may not be part of trust culture. But as you were talking mm-hmm. through that, I, I started thinking down a, a slightly different path. But I think one, whether it's part of trust culture or not, I think is is incredibly important. So you you asked me to watch Band of Brothers. Yes, I did. Um, so I don't watch a lot of TV unless it's documentary, unless it comes highly recommended. Um, so I've, I've been watching Band of Brothers. And um, one of the things that I've picked up is that Easy Company, it felt like not only did they have complete trust in each other, but they had almost like complete knowledge of each other, yeah. of strengths and weaknesses, what their fears were, what their motivations were, what what they could rely on, what, you know, all of those things. And, you know, those are things that I think historically we've pawned off as kind of touchy-feely HR things. Well, let, let's let HR work with, like, personality profiles and understanding people. But how important is it in trust or is it to to be able to take down those barriers and say, this isn't just Jim, you know, an implementation guy that works at 33.6, but to spend the time to truly understand and know him and how much does that knowledge of him as a person go to build trust? Yeah, Maybe that was a stretch, but... No, no, no. It's, it's hugely important because I think you understand where people have their strengths and weaknesses based off of um, personality traits. For example, Jason, we'll go back to your and I's experience together. Um, you know, I always looked at you as somebody who always was willing to let the other person do the talking early in your career. Um, I don't know if you remember, um, but you, you, you were a little bit reticent to, you know, get out in front of the customer and, and really take over. But yeah, I'll give you a very specific example of when my trust factor with you went through the roof. We were sitting in Joe Chody's office at MLB, and um, Joe Joe's a very powerful – Jim, I don't know if you ever worked with Joe, uh, uh, but he's a very, very powerful personality, um, very commanding personality in the room. And Jason, I got, I think I got myself tied in a little bit of a knot as to what we were going to actually be able to do for MLB and in, in, in a certain deliverable that they wanted done. And I was a little nervous because taking you with me, I knew that you had the technical chops and you had the, the, the intelligence and, and, and the brain power to solve all these problems. But I was, I was nervous that you would be nervous to open your mouth and really kind of maybe challenge Joe a little bit. But I remember, and you may not remember this, but I remember you kind of stepping in for me a little bit when I was starting to wobble and do you took that meeting over and you were speaking with a ton of confidence and a ton of I mean it wasn't just confidence in the product but you were confident in what the solution that you were presenting to him as as a as a real solution for their business a multi-billion dollar business and dude ever from that from that meeting on there were very few people that I wouldn't want to have in the room more than you so so, you know, you and I maybe have, you know, because we, we spent a lot of time together at Onmetry, even though we were in different departments, um, I was a little nervous about taking you because I thought you might freeze a little bit in, in front of a powerful personality like this, but you did the exact opposite. And at that point, you proved to me that, you know, hey, this is somebody I can take. We can go. I don't care who we're talking to. Jason knows what he's talking, to, talking about, and he'll stick to it. So maybe that was learned. Um, I, that was actually kind of an opposite, I mean, an opposite, ex, opposite example of really knowing who you're working with. Um, but I, I really, I really saw that in you. And, and at that point, that's when I knew, okay, going forward, I know where I can include, uh, Jason in, in some pretty tough conversations. So anyway, 
and maybe that came from just our, our, our relationship together. I, I, I don't know. No, and I think being open to, again, saying it's okay for me to spend time to understand and, and have a knowledge of, of who I'm working with. And I'm not just an yep. individual, right? This is a team right. and, 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 and really investing in that I, I think is, is extremely powerful. Um, yep. So, you know, where, where do you see things going? I mean, you're obviously like super, super passionate about this, this topic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I find it interesting that we all have these things that we're passionate about that don't necessarily align with what we're paid to do. You know, we, we're, yeah. we're really passionate about, you know, the whole remote work thing and building autonomy and companies aren't paying us to advise on that. They're paying us to advise on their behavioral analytics data. Um, right. But we still try to find ways to weave those things we're passionate into what we're doing. So like, what does the future look like for, for you? I mean, you're obviously super passionate about this topic. Um, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know that it's part of your, your day job to, to kind of build trust cultures. What you know, what do you want to do with it? I you obviously want to make a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And and I, I um it's funny because back in the Omniture days I actually bought trustculture.com <laughs> because I wanted to I wanted to build out a methodology that, that people could maybe go to and, and learn about how they could how they could implement a trust culture in in their orgs or even you know within their their small teams because i really believe that the that trust is the uber culture it's the overlying i mean it it, it supersedes anything and so um and also i wanted something that i could kind of help build out just maybe plant some seeds um for people who are interested and help them start creating a culture of trust in their organizations, especially small teams, you know, um, you know, 33 sticks isn't a 500 person org. Um, you know, you're still small and, and you have that, that benefit. And when I think about larger organizations, I mean, boy, I, I think trying to affect change in a large, large organization is really difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because of all the different personalities and the processes and the procedural things and all those things that we have to take into consideration. But the reason I like trust culture is is because I don't is because it is 100% absolutely unequivocally a personal culture that you can instill if it's just you. You can create a trust culture just around yourself. So we talked about, you know, Jim, you brought up one of your big ones was do what you say you're going to do. So I'm going to turn that back on you, Jim. Are you a person who does what he says he's going to do? And maybe that's a rhetorical. You don't have to answer that. But you see no, what I'm I mean, saying? Like it, you can start a trust culture by just doing a, a self, a, like an interview with yourself and say, am I a trustworthy individual? Do people, do people look at me as somebody that they can trust in this organization? Um, and if so, why? And if not, why? And, um, and that's what I think is so really neat, uh, is so neat about uh, the, the trust culture is it starts with individuals. It's not a mandate top down. It starts with us individually and then we can build it out. So, so Jim, I mean, if you do it like a self inventory of your trustworthiness, you know, whether it be people that you work with or your customers that you advise, you know, how trustworthy do you think you are? Right. And, 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 you know, what can we, what, you know, maybe how you can improve your skill set um, to become a, a, a trustworthy person in, in an org. I mean, I, I like to believe I am. Um, and that, that's not meant as a, as a cop out answer because mm -hmm. like if, you, if we were to go like to, to a number four on here, yep. um, not being a hypocrite is, is number four. So if I'm going to say what I expect of other people, then I need to expect of myself. Now, Granted, do I fall short at times? Do but I try. You know what I do is I try to own it. If you know something just comes up and I, I say I'm going to do something and uh, it gets lost, you know, own that mistake and you know lo look to, to to correct it. But you know if we go back to like, you know, do I believe I do what I'm going to say I'm going to do? I I, I believe yeah nine times out of ten I'm going to do it. You know there, there's going to be the times where I'm just not perfect. Yeah. No, and that and that's I think that's some Jason. You asked, "What do I want to do with this?" I I really don't know how you commercialize it or how I really, but I, I do want to take the time now to build out some content, some content. Uh, eventually, launch trustculture.com and and really start a discussion because I don't have to do it at the I don't have to do it at a company level. 
we can do it just the three of us. I can do it with myself, to be honest with you. I can sit and, and, and have a self-evaluation of whether I'm a trustworthy person. And, and I'm going to open up my, expose my underbelly a little bit here. One, one of the things that, that I suck at is I, I, I'm a gossiper. And I don't think that's a very good characteristic. Um, and what I mean by that is if somebody at my company that I don't necessarily have a lot of respect for falls on his or her face and somebody comes into my office and is like, oh, did you see what so-and-so did? And, oh, we went to the, did you hear the, you know, all this, all this negativity. I propagate it. I, I continue to, I pile on. And I don't, I don't think that's a very good characteristic of anybody. And I certainly don't think it's a very good characteristic of a trustworthy person. And so, you know, I've, I've really taken that into my personal inventory uh, recently. And I'm, I'm doing my best to be more positive and not speak poorly of, of people in the org, even if they deserve it. I don't think it helps the org to do it. And it doesn't make me, you know, any better of a person or any smarter or look like I'm clued in to keep doing that, to keep propagating that type of negative attitude. And so there's, there's a lot of things that with the trust culture, you just look at, you start with yourself and I promise you, you got a lot to work on. All of us do. And then if you can, you know, it becomes contagious. It becomes Jason's tie in the office. People don't know, (laughs) but some, but something, but something's different about Jason this week. And what is it? And, and maybe just by focusing ourselves on being more trustworthy ourselves, it can leak to maybe the person who sits next to us or maybe our boss or maybe somebody who works with us or for us and and it just kind of becomes organic that way it it may not may not penetrate the entire organization but hopefully it rubs off on the people that we work with um, most frequently yeah it's such a it's such a great way to i guess i'll use the tie to tie it up um you know, it's. It, I, I think if, if nothing else, it's an important message to take away from this conversation is that at the individual level, we can have a tremendous impact. And, yep. and really, you know, putting ourselves in a position to be vulnerable and being honest with ourselves about what we can work on and, and how we can be that example. It doesn't matter if we work in a 500 or a 500,000 person company, a, a person of one can, can really have an impact. Um, and I like to think about it as, you know, throwing a pebble in a pond and it puts a little, you know, ring out there and that's gonna hit someone else and they're gonna drop their own pebble. And, and you really lose track of how far that, that message and that ideology can, can spread when, when you do that. Um, just from a personal example, I had someone that I really trust, uh, it's probably been about a year or so, reach out to me and said, hey, I would love to see you be a bit more positive on social media. You know, cut back on being critical, cut back on, you know, spreading things that are mean or just not necessary. And I'd love to see you focus on just being more positive and helpful. And I really took that to heart. And I I hear his voice every time I go to post something where I'm like, I just want to complain about something. And I and I often either don't post it or I, I try to come up with a more positive way. But it's been amazing. And the feedback I've gotten from people are loud, like you're just so positive and I just want to be around that. I want to be part of that. And I've been trying to be more positive because of that and you know it's it it it, it is it, like you can you can be a team of one and and want and and really latch on to this idea of trust culture and say you know what i'm going to be a team of one that embraces trust culture i'm going to start with me and without even trying to do anything to propagate it or or market it people will take notice and people will start wearing ties around the office without without you doing anything about it that's i think that's absolutely true and and I think there's something inherent about the qualities of the people that we do trust that we've run into over the course of our lives that are, um, some of them are kind of unspeakable and um, it, it goes back to character and I think that, you know, you have an opportunity as an individual to take immediate action. So, so many things in our careers, we feel like we're, we're held back a little bit because it's always somebody else's decision or it's always somebody else's somebody else needs to take action for it to happen. Well, in, in a trust culture, I, I truly believe that it has to start with the individual first, um, a self-examination. And, um, and with that, as you sh- really try and, and strive to improve the way people see you and what, you know, I, I'm gonna go back to what Jim mentioned, do what you're gonna say you're gonna do. If all you do is focus on that for one month, every email that you write, that you commit to something, 
you better be damn sure that you're going to do it. And if you have a history of, of, of maybe procrastination like I do, you better be on the stick. And I think, I think that's probably the most effect, the, the most effectual change that comes from the trust culture is what it does to us individually rather than what it does as an org. So that we can take that, I mean, when we leave job A and go to job B, that culture should be able to follow you because it's part of you now. And you can then start to instigate that in, in your new group, wherever you land. And so it's, that's why I call it the Uber culture. It, it goes with you no matter where, where you are. And uh, that's, that's why I really like it. So hopefully, you know, with, with the community, people who are interested, I'd love to build out more resources just to open up the conversations and, and hopefully we can just improve ourselves. And by improving ourselves, we're gonna improve our teams and we're gonna improve our companies. Yeah, no, I, I love that. So I, man, I appreciate you, you coming by. This has been a, an absolutely fantastic conversation and you know, we're definitely following what, what you're, you're doing and are, are really interested to see where this goes. I, you know, I know internally it's something that's critically important to us and we're going to strive to be an example. And to your point, you know, I call it the coaching tree. You know, we've had, we've had John recently leave and it was hard, but I look at it as, well, he's now part of our coaching tree and he's going to take that culture of trust and, and build that in another company. And that's going to be uh, amazing. So, um, yeah, if, you know, people listening, you know, topic Dan is passionate about, reach out to him, chat about it. Um, and again, let's, you know, we're, we're interested in keeping an eye on, on where this goes, but, um, it's something we're, we're excited about and passionate about as well. And something that we try to live, um, as, as part of our culture. Well, I appreciate the invite to come and chat about it. I, I wish it was more formulated and more well thought out. And we'll have you back. There's, 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 there's so much more to do. And, and when it does get a little bit more uh, consumable, I'd love to be able to share it with you guys and, and your listeners. Absolutely. Definitely. Cool. Awesome. Well, cool. thanks, guys. I sure appreciate it. Sorry for being late. Locked myself yeah, no in worries. my office. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best is We've that I locked myself. I locked myself out of my office with my phone and my key card to get back in the building. So I went outside. I couldn't even get in the building. So wow. I had to run. Yeah, it was, it was just, I'm like sweating I think, because I was running I think around. there's an IT crowd episode where one of the guys gets locked out of the building. <laughs> that's that's that was me. That's a good one. That's me. That's me. <laughs> well, to, to right, that, I, I just, it reminded me of something that happened last week when Jen and I were in London. Um, we're, we're out one night trying to get dinner and we're we're going through like this 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 mall which leads us to a parking garage we're like oh if we go this way we should be able to get across the street to this one restaurant we're getting to so we go into a stairwell and we walk down like two flights (laughs) of steps and we come up to like an alarm door we're like okay can't go that way we walk back up can't get back in we can't get back through the other door because there's no (laughs) handle on the other side we can only come through the one side so we're like what do we do so like I had visions of us calling the client we were visiting to say, we need you to come to this street, follow this path, and meet us in this stairwell to get us out. And well, I mean, we eventually went down to the door. We just like, you know what? Bite the bullet. She pushed the door, and we went through the door, and no alarm went off. So nice. we're like, okay, let's go. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it happens. It, yeah. It happens. Cool. Okay, guys. Well, Good thanks stuff, again. Man. I sure appreciate it. Um, yep. Looking forward to, to chatting with you guys later as well. Yeah, thanks, Yeah, Dan. definitely. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for the invite. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Just we'll see you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to reach us, you can do so by emailing podcast at 33sticks.com or on the web at www.33sticks.com. The 33 Tangents Podcast is a production of 33 Sticks.